<laughs> We're saving that for OnlyFans. Okay. We're gonna paste <laughs> that there. Hit OK. And we should have a Robert. Aha! I feel like I just gave birth. But <laughs> <laughs> You're a oh trooper, my. man. On tonight's show, we're going to be talking here, finally, <laughs> starting about an hour late. But on tonight's show, we're going to be talking here with the uh, the fine people behind VCR. Now, what is VCR, you might ask? Well, let me tell you. VCR is Vegas Combat Robotics. But you, at home, may know them as the team that brought you the uh, fine robot known as Jackpot in the last season of BattleBots. Now, we had them on just a, a week or so ago. We were talking mainly about uh, the BattleBot stuff, but we never really got deep into the regional stuff. So that's what I wanted to make sure I had brought you guys back for. So, finally, introductions from Robert's side. <laughs> it's late. Okay, just to give people a little bit of background, how did you start off into the into the world of robots? Back in high school, my mom was a teacher, so I had a future teacher come up to me at a party and be like, all right, you're going to have to join the robotics team. And that's how I started out with robotics. And then I did it for three years, sophomore, junior, and, and senior. Yeah. And I was the captain of the robotics team. And then I did a couple of years mentoring and then that kind of fell away for multiple years and then BattleBots came back on and I started getting back into it and that's when I I started looking for a local community and I found the VCR group and found Jeff and we built our first robot actually. Yeah. My first robot. Hold on. So this oh. is a tink. Yeah. It's a 150 gram robot. So it's pretty light, but uh, it does quite a bit of damage. So it's a undercutter. So the, the bra blade runs pretty darn close to the ground. Yeah. And then tries to cut out the wheels of other robots. And it was heavily designed, inspired by Valkyrie, which I ended up getting it signed during our first year at the competition. Oh, that's really cool. Jeff. So it sounds like, it sounds like Robert uh, caught the bug, but you were the one that already had VCR up and running. How long ago was that? Oh, uh, I think by the time I met Robert, I started VCR about a year or so before that. I, I built an open air arena in my old house and it never really took off. Robert was basically the first real member besides me. Like I had a bunch of people from R RC racing and drones and stuff like that, that yeah. were interested, but I never really went past that. As far as people I knew in the community, I was mostly just traveling to events and fighting with robots because I had no local events, so I had to travel everywhere to go fight. Yeah, so I definitely want to get into the to the local stuff here shortly. So now you actually bought your first arena from another BattleBots team, right? Our first arena was given us given to us by. Martin Mason from Mad Catter. Oh, that's but awesome. A, uh, we ended up not using it because it was an arena built for a pre the previous era of bots where, you know, they were, they hit hard, but they weren't like what they are today. That yeah. arena that they gave to us would not hold up to what we have today. But it was enough to get you started. It was enough to, to let you, know. it was enough to clean out the garage enough to fit a, a robot arena in. It, it was, yeah, it was more of a motivation piece because we got it than the shell that goes around the floor. It's uh, rough. We don't want to get anyone hurt if we host an event. So we built a new mm -hmm. shell for the outside of it. And at the same time, I like, if we're doing a new shell, might as well just do a new floor too. So we ended up building a whole arena. Mm, yeah. So that's like, we almost. 
replaced it immediately. We replaced it immediately. I don't. We only did a couple test fights in it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, my my old computer that I used to do the show on had so many problems. I said that it needed a keyboard replacement, where you just take the keyboard and you put it on a brand new computer and everything's great. <laughs> so Shay, how did you meet up with the uh, with the merry band of of mayhem? I had moved to Las Vegas from Chicago in trade show industry. My husband got transferred, and they took me to, I guess, obviously, and uh, once BattleBots came back on, I was watching it and getting really excited whenever watching the episodes and stuff, but it was just me by myself. Like we hadn't really, we were working so much. We hadn't made a lot of friends, but on Facebook, like I commented something after the re Mars event about, Oh man, I wish I'd known that was here. I'd have tried to go. And Jeff saw it and was like looking for locals who would be interested in building in events. And he reached out and was like, Hey, do you want to, do you want to build robots or just go to events? And I was like, yes. Yes. And, have some, uh, please. So then I met up with the guys and helped paint the arena, like the first replacement arena floor that, or or the first arena floor that we painted, which turned out to be practice because then the next one came together and we welded it at work and that kind of thing. But I wasn't really a building at the time, but then the guy showed me how to solder and get all done. So I made, you know, the logo and stuff, and then it really kicked off. We could start planning events. And it was all downhill from there. That's awesome. So how long has VCR been running? I can get you a, a real number, but no, the, uh, no real numbers. Four years, four years, maybe four years now. Okay. Very cool. So this is an Three, example of, a, two, of a, one of the smaller one, matches. Now, what go. size are we looking at here? I'm going to go ahead and we're doing that. Make sure that I can hear. Oh, okay. Three pounders. Yeah. Right. It's coming back from, from a, uh, Connecticut, so it's a little rough. Uh, oh, yeah. We're going to talk about Norwalk here in just a second. but So that's off track, right? That's one of yours. Yeah. Yes, and now it's off track in this video? Yeah, that's version three of off track. I was holding version four. Oh, wow. Okay. So this was what, last year probably? Well, that was roughly about a year ago at uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. And it was okay. this... this organization's first event that's cool oh so they don't even have any doors they come in through a chute on the bottom yeah they changed that now after we, we suggested to them that if something bad happened you need to be able to get it out of the arena quick they didn't change it you still have to go through the so Wait, I, there, I thought you, i thought there was a door added you told me they added the door for this the one they made it easier to fit through the hole. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Uh, They're considering it, I'm sure. It's outside, so if they really had to, they could just let it burn down. That's true, yeah. So nothing like a, not that. Nothing like a good lithium fire to really kick right. things off. Plan B. And, and those do happen quite often. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, we saw in BattleBots... There was tons of robots that would catch fire, and just like the thick smoke that would come off of that, this, it's pretty awesome. At the same time, you gotta send the guys in the hazmat suits with the big old smoke sucker and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. When yeah. that happens with the small competitions, we clear everybody out. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So this, so what size are we looking at here? So what size is off track? He's a three pounder, right? Yeah, Optrex roughly about four by four inches. Wow. That's Hold on. no, it would it's more more like five by five. I was gonna say my sense it's of scale is totally that. up. Yeah, it's, 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 that looks bigger than that, but then again I got the cat open, let's check this out real quick. Yeah, that's one problem I always have when I'm watching it on, on TV when I'm watching the either BattleBots or the regional stuff like Norwalk is it's so hard to get a concept of size. Cause when you're watching BattleBots, you think they're this big. When you're watching this, if you know how big the ones are on BattleBots, you think they're huge. This is, right, so you can tell I was way off on my estimate. It's 175 millimeters long tip to tip. So oh. that's probably 125. So yeah, divide it. 
four, seven, seven inches long. But they can still pack a pretty good punch. You still have to have some kind of like safety stuff on there. Cause I saw, you know, in Nor watching Norwalk, I definitely saw some things getting thrown around a little bit. Oh yeah. yeah These, you uh, your robot has the same power as an AK-47. Yeah. So it's, it's, if it hits you, it's like getting shot. I don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do everything we can to not do that. Not only is it like get shot, but also like it'll grab, so it'll just tear. Mm. So, yeah. That doesn't sound good at all. So, wow. I can get yeah. one of the chew, chew toys. The aluminum mm. bar. Oh, the chew toys. Yeah, so when we test uh, robots, we just put stuff in the arena to hit. Yeah. Just to stress test the weapon system. And we have... A, a aluminum bar that we hit quite often and it's pretty mangled right now. We were talking a little bit about Norwalk before. Now this was in Utah, right? Yes. Yeah. What we're seeing right now. Okay. But there the, but the one this past, that was this past weekend. And so Norwalk for the uninitiated among us, I basically all I know is it's a regional robot fighting event and it's in Connecticut. That's about it. So for the benefit of, of people who are, who may not be familiar with it, what is Norwalk? I would say Norwalk, currently the biggest event that's going on right now. It's a mix between you know, there's no other events going on, and the guy who runs it has enough money to put on like an awesome show. It really is. Yeah. No, their production room alone, like the the AV room that they have, is just intense. Yeah, it's it's, it's beautiful. Their yeah. Location. Yeah. So who is it that, that puts that on anyway? Is it like, is it sponsored by a company? Is it just some guy or? Austin is a, uh, he, he owned a bunch of uh, tech companies like a few years ago. Ah. And he sold them for a large lump sum. And now he just lives off of that and builds robots and whatever else. Everything from like super powered, like, race carts that he has in his like workshop to uh, yeah. pull on robot combat events. The, the dream. <laughs> oh yeah, no, absolutely. I noticed that, that the maximum size that they have is 30 pounds. Why is that the upper limit? If he can just like, I'm going to build whatever. Is it harder to find competitors or, or what is the thing with that? So building the arenas gets prohibitive. Like it gets really expensive to get the Lexan so everybody's safe and then the arenas have to scale up with it mm -hmm. so it gets really expensive really fast our arena the beetle weight was like two thousand dollars while the 30 is probably ten fifteen thousand dollars mm. so it gets it. really expensive really he fast money for it. it's just he's trying to get the interest basically is what it is yeah, and I'd be willing to bet that not everybody can afford to, to put together a 250-pound robot. Even if you have the robot, it's the logistics of getting the robot to the event. So I was actually going to ask you that. So how did you guys get there? Because you, you brought, what, there were three robots that you guys brought out there. How did you get them there? Was it a, like a car situation, or did you fly? or? I fit everything in a check bag, and I just do that. Now I see the advantage of fighting smaller robots. Like yeah. you, you, so you guys brought out, you, you had Wumbo, you had Off Track that we saw a second ago, and you also brought Cookie. Uh, that was Shay's, was Cookie, right? The most recent mm -hmm. one, yeah. The yeah. last Norwalk, Jeff was there with Robert, yeah. Oh, okay, all right. So at the most I mean, recent- This last one I went to, the one before it, yeah. Ah, I see, okay, gotcha. And, and Wumbo, uh, I don't have any pictures of it, but if you're familiar with uh, with BattleBots, it looks very similar to Huge. It seems like the 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 big wheeled bot thing is like the current. I don't know if I want to say the current meta, but it seems like that's a really big part of it lately. Is that the case? It's there, there's it's a weird meta right now because. There's a lot of things that work, but there's also a lot of things that they it's there's a lot of rock, paper, scissors, and for a right. while there wasn't much to counter the big wheels, but now people 
have been fighting them so often that it's that edge that you used to have is no longer there. COVID has messed up any meta there was because there were a lot of people designing robots, like putting a lot of effort into designing meta breaking robots. So all of a sudden you had a bunch of these robots come out that weren't even a thought before COVID. Mm -hmm. So robots that were doing really well, all of a sudden they're like, Oh, how do I deal with this new robot designs that are coming out? Something that's affecting change too, because usually there's a variety. Some arenas will have a steel floor so you can run magnets for better, like almost giving your yourself a weight bonus by right. sticking more to the floor. And then other venues will have the wood floors like Norwalk. And I think a lot like before Norwalk really kicked off, it seemed like most of the development we were seeing was in the magnet direction because people were building for steel floors. But mm. now that Norwalk is such a big draw, everybody's building specifically for Norwalk. And at Norwalk, you can expect a bunch of, it's not exactly a kit, but beater bar drums are really popular. So a lot of people are coming up with solutions to that specifically. And also mm -hmm. the wood floor thing. Yeah. So that's shaped it a little bit too, I think. Mm. What is the current, you know, paper to the rock of the big wheels thing? What would you build in order to beat Wumbo? A big horizontals, or as you can see here, metal, like, or this is actually a nurple, or murple with an M. Murple, yeah. Yeah, murple ended up winning this fight because they were able to control me the whole time. They were just really durable and I could get purchase on them. Oh, uh, okay. Oh yeah, so I, I forgot this. So this wasn't one of the ones that you won. Sorry. If... No. <laughs> I'll I'll bring up the Ghost Raptor fight. <laughs> the Ghost Raptor pick up for it. There you go. So this is uh, actually one of yours, right? This is this was Cookie, right? Yeah, I can't see that. This is the weapon on Cookie, which is it's about seven inches in diameter is the outer one. The teeth are, you know, about an inch and a half. I have a longer tooth one too, but mm -hmm. yeah, cookie is a little bit of an oddball. It gets a weight bonus for using cap brushes for a bristle brought drive instead of wheels. So it came in at four and a half pounds, which at Norwalk you get five pounds, but mm -hmm. I cut back some things to try and I really wanted it to be four and a half so that I can take it to other events. Yeah. And yeah, it has the internal gear, and then this is messy right now, but you have the bristles drive. And originally they had like cell phone vibration motors in the bristles, mm -hmm. uh, but it really wasn't enough to power it more than the actual vibration of the, uh, the ring spinning. So I wound up making the decision to scrap that at the event. And yeah, so this goes along here and in a perfect world it spins. It had a lot of teething problems, so to speak. Yeah. Just from, I hadn't gotten all the parts in time and it was way more of a rush than I had expected it to be. Yeah. So it was still very, but it was still really great to be in that room with all the other builders and the energy going on there. And I had told them, even if I just spend the time in the test box being here, like this is a really good experience. But yeah. So that's the fancy so, thing about cookie. Yeah, so so for, for the punters like myself, what is a bristle drive? It's not necessarily. I guess it falls in the realm of shufflers. Whenever you have like unconventional drives, what's getting the weight bonuses now more than a true walker and battle bots, they want to reward like articulated walking motion where you can walk independently seeing actual legs mm -hmm. like how chomp is yeah. but like in vegas our weight bonuses are more intended and we're pretty generous with them in vegas they're mm -hmm. more intended to promote creative design in anything that's not wheeled or tracks or like conventional driving so yeah. cat brushes are my solution to that because i am very bad at driving things with wheels <laughs> So this is essentially 
how what we're talking about only when you're what you're talking about shay is something that would use brushes instead of the cleats right mine's basically just a really intense hex bug toy <laughs> oh okay like the only thing really that's happening is the bristles are vibrating what james and go and, and jeff now are like moving towards is making tiny little legs that kind of move that, that are artic not articulated, but are actually have emotion to them. Yeah. The locomotion instead of mine is just taking the energy of the vibration of the robot and scuttling it along. Um, okay. But these are actually like moving on purpose. This is it's directional yeah. movement. Something in the stream that like people know, like the announcers were calling cookie and melty brain, which isn't, really accurate it's just a ring spinner and the bristles are what moves it but the reason i think they were calling it a melty was because the entire system like the, the drive is dependent on the weapon from to work if that makes sense so, so since well, there's only really one motor <laughs> what is a melty brand because i was gonna that was gonna be one of the questions that i asked you I, I kept hearing them use that phrase oh this is a melty brain bot and blah 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 and i was like i don't even what is that so Melty brains are robots that spin in a circle uh, mm -hmm. really fast. And they have some pretty cool programming in it. When they spin, they like they add more power to the motor that's going in the direction they want and take it away from the direction they don't want to go. So mm -hmm. they slowly drift. They're really cool. And there's been some successful ones, but most of them don't do very well because they have, like, how do you know what direction you're pointing uh -huh. issues? And then they have, a lot of times, whenever they hit something, the whole robot's stopping, and all that shock's going into the sensitive electronics they yeah. use to tell what direction they're going and all that. That was going to be one of my questions about that. How in the world do you handle the shock? Like, I, well, I guess really the big question, is there any kind of advantage to that kind of setup? Well, so it actually has a huge advantage. You have to dedicate weight to your weapon, armor, and drive. And uh. Melties, they dedicate it to all at once. So their drive right. is their weapon. So they have a three-pound right. weapon, and then their weapons is also their armor and their drive is what drives the weapon. So you're doing a lot of things at once and yeah. you're, it's really weight efficient. Okay. Okay. You don't have to have power for locomotion. You don't have to have power for weapons. It's just all power. Yeah. I, and, and these bots spin at 200 miles an hour. They're spinning ridiculously fast. That is crazy. The issue with the melty brains is you see, I don't know if the video is up yet, but a um, project liftoff versus uh, Wumbo. The, you'll see one of the issues that melty brains have is they melted their own wheels because they were spinning so fast. Whoa. Um, okay, hold on. That video is out on YouTube. I, yeah, I think um, it's, there we go. That's the one. Wow. So how on earth do you... How do you steer that? I got a really good look at Project Liftoff because I had to fight it twice at Norwalk this time around. Yeah. If you, when it stops, you, you can see there's a, a light, not a LIDAR, an infrared sensor on it. Mm -hmm. And it has two infrared flashlights next to it. Okay. And it uses that to see what's around. And then inside of it is a, I forget what he called it, but it's basically a, it always knows true north. And so any input you give it is relative to true north. Oh, wow. There is no, there is no front of the robot. The front of the robot is, you want to make it go east, north, south, or west. It's a vir yeah. There's a virtual front of the robot, basically. Wow. Yeah, some of them, they work on gyroscopic forces mm -hmm. so they measure how much gy not gyro uh, centrifugal force they're seeing 
and they're able to calculate from that force how fast they're spinning. Oh, okay. Wow. So with so, that level of computer control, then how far, and this was one of the questions that, that somebody wanted us to ask last time you guys were on, but we didn't have time for it. With that level of intelligence on there already, it seems like it would be a short trip to get to AI combat, right? Uh, it's it's really far away. It's isn't uh, when you it's you're looking to grab wheels and it's identifying what's an opponent and what's a wall. And that's really what it is. Identifying what your opponent is and what your opponent isn't is really hard because you could have sonar sensors, but how are you going to tell a difference between a robot and a wall? Or you could ha like, you could have lidar sensors, but then you have to like, yeah, it's the real difficult part about it is identifying what's actually your opponent. So there's been some shots at it, but. Yeah, I saw uh, a while ago, I saw a, I think, I want to say it was a Japanese competition where they were basically uh, playing sumo with the bots and it was all automated. Like they, they yeah. one guy would put their bot down, the other guy would put the other bot down and they would just basically be like, okay, go. And they just turned the bots on and they would move so fast. Yeah. Push the other one out. Yeah. So if you watch those videos, one of the big things is there's nothing behind the like wow. there's no walls and yeah. they have that nice white ring at the base mm. so it's designed to be easily programmed unfortunately you can't do that with a combat interesting somebody's gonna somebody's gonna figure out a oh way. yeah <laughs> right now the big leader in automation is uh chomp they didn't weren't able to get it this year but they had they were trying to automate the hammer so they mm -hmm. didn't have to touch the hammer when it was it would automatically track and then once uh, an opponent was in the right range it would just bring down the hammer automatically and they didn't do anything mm -hmm. unfortunately this year their sensors were messed up because of uh this is the armor they had up front, it was getting weird reflections or something like that. Mm. But previous years, they did exactly that, and it worked pretty well. In fact, one of the most famous automated things, like they took out bite force with, it was some imaging process, and it sniped the weapon belt. So there are some people that are looking into that. That's a that is a very clever idea. Yeah, like yeah. I I love there when they when there's a lot of innovation. There was one bot last year that had a a single slug and that was its primary weapon. It was just this this just a big I think it was like a 1 pound slug that it actually fired and there was like just one shot. I can't remember the name of it. It was either last it, it wasn't in this last like the last season but the one before that. No, um, that was, it was double what? jeopardy. <laughs> and that was a five pound slug. It was five pound. I, w I, I didn't want to yeah. over exaggerate it, but yeah, because one is bad enough, but five, good God. It's interesting. I heard they're actually, they can shoot harder, mm -hmm. but the event organizers are like, we have glass and we don't want you to punch through this glass and start taking people out. So they've been asking them to slow it down, which really nerfs the robot. Mm -hmm. but uh, that's so, actually one i think uh jackpot like if you shoot straight down jackpot you're taking out those belts and the weapon motors mm -hmm. yeah so that's wow. one i'm a little scared of but do you feel like the rules that they impose keep people from innovating yeah you can't fire stuff you gotta take safety into account obviously of course but like you should give a, a kind of like the way you guys do where you give a bonus to something if it's different so i, I guess what do you mean by innovating if you have a I mean, constant set of rules and you have yeah. a lot of similar bots coming in you have a lot of bots innovating in how to make that bot better whatever competition you go to the rules will force evolution because 
that's bot builders, whether it's slightly improving wedgelets or like coming up with a crazy walker design. So it's more like guided innovation. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I think part of the innovation of it too is and at BattleBots they said this a lot too. They're like, look, your opponent is the other robot. The opponent is not the arena. So if your design by default involves like poses a significant risk to the arena, you have to not you have to innovate around that. You have yeah. to innovate so that you're controllable. That's part of why everybody's like, oh, when are there going to be melties at BattleBots? And it's when a melty can control its movement enough such that it's not just guaranteed to be a Lexan shredder, then you can talk about it. But in, yeah. in gyro walk or stuff like that, and I think that's why they're really big into the articulated motion for walking, is mm-hmm. you can get a lot of unconventional drive that might not be predictable or as controllable as you'd want it to be. Yeah. So that's part of the the challenge the same way you would work for a steel floor or a wooden floor. You have to be looking at what the actual arena limitations are. And that's part of what you're developing. Like a lot of I'm personally not super offended by the tip speed limits because the material science that has made our bots capable of being so strong, there is still a max on what arena walls can withstand or affordably be replaced in like a production right. timeline oh yeah so sometimes it is a bummer like from a showmanship standpoint if they don't mm-hmm. want like flamethrowers to be used within a certain perimeter of the walls like it yeah. can be really restrictive but i think a lot of times limits like that actually prod the innovation too because if you have to make a really tightly controlled yeah. robot like that's its own challenge that's yeah. true so regional events so you guys so we talked about a little bit about norwalk before and we talked about how you guys had started out with your las vegas group so this is your arena right or it yeah. used to be no yeah that one's uh, so the arena. one we still use okay and now this is from the before times because there's people in a room together this yeah. was when, when was this like last uh, January or something, wasn't it? Some, somewhere around there. Yeah. It was old, our first old event. Year. Our first event was in November, at Millennium Fandom, and then our second was at the 702 RC Raceway in January. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's just so cool. So now this is the arena that you guys are going to start back up doing events with, right? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, we're. We've been looking into where we want to do our next event. You know, we're still trying to figure out how many, how big we want the competition because the, depending on if we have 32 robots in each weight class being yeah. ants, beetles, and fairies, that's, you need a, large area to fix all of those. The so, nice thing oh, wow. though now during this last season of BattleBots and now that like we've been able to be more vocal and present on Instagram and we've been seen a little and especially now that people saw us on 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 the show we do have more local builders so something we always wanted to do was <laughs> local smaller events before like our options are really like who can we get in from out of state like what friends of ours will come and fight with yeah. us, which is a big ask for traveling a lot of us do it but but hopefully now we can do smaller more regular things that the local builders can just come out and we can do different kind of not necessarily double elimination tournaments but mm-hmm. we have a couple different ideas for ways to structure events or like Robert can explain his chip design, but we have different like different ways to structure an event so that everybody can fight as much as they want and wins will still, we still have a winner at the end kind of thing. Oh, interesting. Uh, do you- yeah. So the, the idea we've been throwing around for uh, a new tournament style is everybody gets three chips when they sign up for the competition and then you 
bet on your own matches and you could bet one chip or two chips if you uh, want. And uh, it gives you an opportunity, say you go into your first match and you get wrecked really hard. You have time to fix your robot and then do a bunch of matches to catch up where some, in a lot of competitions, there'll just be, you're out. We can't wait any longer. Or you get a chance to fight. Like a lot of times you'll drive, you'll go to a different state to go fight robots and then you'll fight people from your own state, which that's not fun. <laughs> so it gets you a chance to choose who you want to fight too. Yeah. There, there are major issues with the, with the thing. Maybe a really good robot's not going to get any challenges, but that's not how our community works. I'm sure they're going to get a lot of challenges. It could be abused, but hopefully it's not going to happen and it'll be just a fun time and a much more builder friendly and relaxed event. And I think it will be better for the spectators because we'll be constantly running event. They're like constantly running fights because people will fight as soon as they're ready instead of waiting for their fight to come up. That's going to be so cool. I think now that we have more of a local community, I think for at least getting back started again, and we're just going to focus on smaller things. And then once we can do a, a big blot like the dust up was, it was super fun and a big event will be really fun. But the smaller ones I think are, are where we're really going to shine in the next few months because you know, we can do, we can do more experimental things. Yeah. One of the interesting things about this past year is that it did give, I, I don't want to go too far off topic, but it, it broke down all the things they said, no, we have to do it this way because blah, blah, blah. It turns out, no, we didn't have to do it that way at all. We have to have an office. No, you don't have to have an office. But also, like you were saying, it's changed around the meta of the game because, because everybody went off on their own and now is coming back. They're like, okay, now I need to build something to beat a huge or to beat a Wumbo or to be whatever, or beat a horizontal bar beater. Like that kind of gave it. It's almost like the forced seclusion also forced innovation. Do you see that as well? Oh yeah. I think I... The, the force, like staying inside being forced to just sit there. A lot of people just were like, let's do a crazy design. I've been putting off forever because I have a bunch of time now. I think it's a lot of new, a lot of new builders too. I think it has, it, it would have come to the scene too. Cause a lot of people realized there is a community here, especially online. You can get advice on what kind of motors. There are some kits available or there's starter kits or like starting points like finger tech, I think has a couple different kits that are designed for people to think about how to put their own bot together. Even if it's using the same weapon, how you're going to assemble it and build the chassis and everything is all up to the individual. So yeah. I think that's part of it too. Like the established builders are going a little doing anything that they've thought about they're in a vacuum so they can try it. And then a lot of new builders have been coming out with reliable things that make them competitive off the bat. So it's not like you have a bunch of people just coming together with stuff with hot glued together. I, I am one of the people with hot glue everywhere, but <laughs> uh, competitive than people expected it to be, or maybe that it was before. I think that's a lot of it too is everyone being locked inside their house or finding all these videos of combat robots and other stuff yeah. and they're, they're at home all day so they're like maybe i should build one of these and now we're getting to the point where we're starting to see how those are starting to come out and all the people that we're looking to build are finally getting to the point where they have something that they can take to somewhere or show off or you find a local community there's even a few people that we'd even know about that we just recently 
Robert recently came across out in Utah that they're Vegas builders. They didn't even know about us. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's funny because that's not the first uh, person we found. We found an, we went to a, a Arizona event and found a local builder. <laughs> like we have a community in Vegas. Sometimes that's just not how it works. And, they find robots through something else. Yeah. I had no clue about it until I saw you guys on TV. I had no idea that you guys, and it's not like, it's not like the sin shops any stranger to Pololu for goodness sakes. We, uh, we've been in, in with them for a long time. So Shay brought this up and I know, I know I'm going to get myself in trouble now. If theoretically somebody who might host a podcast was wanting to build a robot, how do you start? So what is the way in all seriousness, what is the way to, to just, I want to do the sloppy first copy. I want to make just something that is remote control that goes forward, backwards and spins a thing. So how does one uh, attain such a thing? Depends. So if you can toss a little bit of money at it, I would buy a D2 kit or some of the kits that are out there. They'll tell you I how to assemble it. Theater kit, I think it, it comes with like UHMW for the chassis and like some of the electronics, but you're still making the decisions about how you want to put it together. I think yeah. that's, that's one. Or the, Ve- the Viper kit, I think is like a one pound that's like, yeah a little tombstone kind of thing that you can see it's meant to need improvement. Mm. So you can, you know, put it together, see how it works, understand more of the physics once you get it moving around and then figure out how can you make it defend defensible or what do you want to change about it and start alterations that way. So that's a good so- starting point. If you don't have something in your head that you're like, Oh, I want to do this shaped thing. In which case I would say, Oh, Fusion 360 has a hobby license. You can start designing in CAD. Once you know what you need to make and you have the motors in your hands and everything you can measure, I'm a person who has to hold everything in my hand. These guys download (laughs) the STLs or whatever for the parts so they can fit them together, but Mm -hmm. or step files rather. But once you know what you need to make, it gets more intuitive to design it. Like CAD design can seem really uh, intimidating, but if you know what numbers you need to put in and you know what the shapes need to be, you can, it's easier to learn that way too. Is there a vendor that you guys recommend that like I see finger tech Viper robot kit. Are they a decent? Yeah. So those are, those are all good. Uh, robot matter has some really good stuff. Once you get more advanced, as far as the, basic like i'm just getting started in the robotics it's going yeah. to be finger tech it's going to be bot kits uh, kit bots and a, uh, the other one is battle kits and all of them make robots all the way from 150 grams to three pounders wow okay so i'll throw bot kits in the uh, in the chat here just so people can see what we're talking about here because uh, last lesson. Oh, go ahead. End box is the one that makes the vector, and the vector is a two-wheel drive, really long bar spinner. And it's a really good robot kit. Uh, so kit bots vector. So there's kit bots. There's bot kits. There's vector or the end bots from vector. There is rectified robots. There, there's so many of them. I can drop a link in there, but there's so many people building their own kits nowadays that you can easily find something that interests you. There's- now, see, oh, go ahead. Jeff being more in tune with the community than I am. Is there a bad kit you know of? Because I, all the kits I've seen do a good job. There's kits that if you buy them, you might get shamed by some people, but that's about it. Yeah. So that that would be D2s there. 
very competitive, but they don't have weapons, and they frustrate a lot of builders because you could buy one and do really well and win competitions with it. Okay. But I don't there's understand. also, just in terms of entry level, like things that annoy people, you know, that as a newcomer might attract negative attention on Facebook comments or something. D2 kits are funny because they don't have a weapon at all, which a lot in competition, it can be if 2D kits are fighting each other. It's difficult to make that a really entertaining fight. Um, yeah. And since they are so competitive, a lot of times that can happen where they, they're just a face that your fist can't punch <laughs> or punch hard enough. So right. they can make it really far. But also when you're starting out and you start with a weapon, a spinning weapon, yeah. a lot of times people get, oh, if you if you don't have experience, you shouldn't be starting with a weapon. If you don't, don't start with a weapon unless you've already gotten, you already know what you're doing. I that feels like terrible advice. It's, it's coming from a place of concern for safety, which is part of why okay. like having access to a test box or having a test box at home if you can being part of a community that has an arena that you can safely spin up. A lot of people will post videos of how proud they are of getting their weapon spinning, but if it's a foot away from you on a table, Don't. it's hard to retain, it's hard to appreciate how dangerous it is when you're just so proud of accomplishing it sometimes. So that's like the line that gets, okay, we're really concerned about safety. We don't want people just making these weapons willy nilly kind of thing, but right. also we really like weapons in competition. So yeah, yeah. I, get I, conflicting I think that, advice. I think that's a great point. If you buy one of these kits and it has a weapon on it, be extremely careful. These weapons are meant to bend steel and Mm -hmm. destroy metal parts so they're gonna go and they're gonna go right through skin like it's nothing just be yeah. aware if you yeah. if if you buy these kits you have to be careful with them we were saying earlier that that which, which one is it off track hits with the energy of an ak-47 yeah yeah and that's a kit that's a kit weapon yeah, the wow. weapon on the front comes from a, an existing robot kit. Yeah. But mm. that's kind of the thing is like you make them because they're fascinating and they're you're in awe of how powerful they can be and it's something you want to show off. But I think right. there is a weird double think that comes into play once it's something that you're working on because it is sculptural, in, in my opinion, to be oh, making yeah. these that, things. That makes and sense, when yeah. you're looking at it that way, and you're looking at it as like, oh, I've made this badass thing. It's hard to respect the machine in a lot of ways. Like if you're in a machine shop, working with table saw, stuff like that, a lot of times when you're just looking at it as its utility relative to your project, you're not necessarily yeah. thinking about what it physically is and what it can physically do to you. And just because that's not what you want it to do at the time doesn't mean it can't. That's the main thing is like yeah. coming up with a like something that we were trying to, that we're working on. And a lot of people in the community are developing is like a, a test box kit because it's hard when people are trying to save money and cobble a bot together on a budget, which we all understand. Yeah. They're saying, oh, you need to spend like $100, $150 on these parts to make a test box. That's not really fun and sexy. Like people don't want to do that. Right. So coming up with a test box, maybe you can like decorate with stickers or customize to be part of your kit your setup your boss yeah. setup making yeah. that fun too is like something that i personally like to do because hmm. every everything a... in my toolbox itself it's all fun and i put stickers on it it's branded and so a test box is like that too it's just as important when you're building at home okay so now i have websites in which i can spend way too much money and uh, and go there oh in the chat somebody asked uh, you can't just make a plexiglass box well, you can. Like with beetles, you have to go quarter inch, which is really or with expensive. An air gap. 
which is really complicated. Yeah. yeah. Wait, or, how heavy are the beetles? I don't know. Three pounds. Three pounds. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it doesn't yeah, seem like it, a lot. Respecting the limits of your test box is also a thing. You could because you can make a plywood box with the Lexan lid over it. A lot of people are doing that. We found like. Ikea has like a wooden box, like it's supposed to be a wagon toy that you hmm. can put together. And for an ant weight or a beetle, you can spin up in there. If you have a lid on a Lexan lid kind of thing that's secured, but a test box too is only as safe as you make it. So yeah. you can put together something that will look on camera. Like, oh yeah, see it's protected. But like, if you're doing it in, a, in a, an aquarium or something, it's not going to protect you. It's not going <laughs> to no. protect anything. It's just going to generate worse. a lot of shrapnel. So you, yeah. it's not so much the point of having something. It's having something that is on par with the machine you're making. Right. That's the important part. Yeah, you got to so, build yeah, for the machine. you can just make anything as long as it can withstand what you need it for. Yeah. Wow. Uh, also in the chat, somebody asked, uh, what makes a better weapon? Piercing, rotating, slashing, grasping, clawing, etc. and why? I think we've already gone over this with the uh, with the rock, paper, scissors analogy earlier. But do you guys have anything you want to add to that? So in insect weights, which are three pounds and under, you have like, you have your spinners on um, and then you have your lifters and wedges. And that's the only weapons that are out there. There are some people trying to be crushers, but they're not very successful. So mm -hmm. that's that's about it. There's not many. Yeah, th that's about it. That would be a hell of an engineering feat to, to make a crusher in three pounds. Yeah, so in terms of cutting versus impact though, that's it really depends what problem you want to solve. Like you can see Star Child at Norwalk, like it's a great cutting and impact thing. Yeah. But it gets stuck a lot. It's its goal is to get to the juicy bits and puncture them. So it really depends how you want to try and beat somebody. If you want to beat them by throwing them across the arena with a good hit like impact, mm -hmm. a beater bar might be for you if you want something that can slice through and get tear up tires and stuff. A skinny weapon is going to be what you want. You can have different configurations if you want, but it really depends on your opponent. So, speaking of crushers, they're really tough, and a lot of people are like, I can put down 600 pounds. Wombo got cr crushed by a 600-pound robot at Norwalk. We did a fun thing against one of the house bots. Oh, okay. and Wombo was like the wheels would still spin at the end of the competition. It, like crushers are weird. You have to apply an insane amount of pressure to actually do anything. Yeah. And it's gotta be in exactly the right spot too. Cause if you're right on top of a, on top of a brace, then that's, you're probably not well, going to do that much. Molars versus your incisors. If you're just, the Brett the brick thing or fluffy is a slamming like it's not a concentrated force it's just like a big wall hitting you oh okay but right if, i got you yeah. if fluffy had a spike on it it probably wouldn't have worked the same way yeah so that's so part of what you're looking of... at too if you want your crusher to be just like a brick wall then that's probably not going to be as effective as a big tooth Okay. All right. Yeah. So what you're describing like the, uh, the difference between, uh, if you've got a spinner with a, with a blunt hammer on it versus one that has a, a teeth like Captain Shredderator. I would say Captain Shredderator is like the sledgehammer. Oh. If you ever seen their teeth, they are the new ones are just essentially S seven bricks. And oh, okay. Yeah, they're just... But the corners are sharp. The corners gouge, for sure. Yeah. The corners are sharp, a square cut piece of metal. Mm -hmm. Just like... <laughs> it's more about, with Captain Shredder, just how much 
power they have behind that shell. It is intense. Then compare it to Gigabyte because they have the flatter teeth, don't they? Or yeah, is that they just do. a configuration of theirs? It's more of a slicer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Mm. They, when Jackpot they really... is designed to be slicing mostly, yeah. oh, right? It does. Yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting. Uh, I would really wish BattleBots would show damage after the fights because. Like against the rotator fight, we were gouging the robot. Like we were gouging parts of rotator off. It's just it doesn't look impressive because you're not seeing the robot flip. You're just seeing the yeah. blades pass through the robot. And oh, um, yeah, and and like we shattered both of rotator's weapon bearings. But yeah. It's funny because you because what you on TV is just they just stop spinning, but you don't know if that's the motor gave out, if that's the speed controller died, or if that's or if someone shattered a freaking bearing. Yeah. You know, it was pretty clear on Ghost Raptor though. Yeah, <laughs> that was, it was. That was that was, that was pretty clear. <laughs> He's minus one head. In the chat, they ask, uh, do they edit a lot of the battle? I'm guessing he's talking. I guess we were talking on BattleBots again. Yeah. So robots don't sound like that in real life. Like BattleBots does heavy editing with the sound. Really? And then they'll, they'll cut the matches together. If you're watching a part of the thing and you're wondering how they all of a sudden get across the arena, usually what that is is they got stuck and they had to separate the robots. Ah. Um, so yeah they edit it and sometimes they do terrible jobs i remember last year what was it it was sawblaze versus waiachi it okay. looked like sawblaze came in clearly after the match ended and, and came down on waiachi but that's not actually what happened oh really no it's just the sound the count out didn't match the actual match. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Why did why do you think that they rec recorded it that way? I think they just missed it during editing. Ah. And but it created huge drama at the time. Sawblaze had to release a statement that we didn't hit after the buzzer. There wasn't a late shot. We swear we didn't hit them like during the count out. It, it was just misrepresented in editing. <laughs> like they had to post about it because people were pissed that they might yeah. have been delivering late hits. That's it's funny. Like that that especially in the last season. I don't know why. Especially in the last season, it seemed like there was a lot of drama. It is so. It is pretty emotional when you're fighting in general. Like there's lots yeah. of opportunities. Like you could screen. You could get a clip of pretty much any emotion on somebody's face during the yeah. battle of any kind. And yeah. when the guys are saying, oh God, or something like, you don't know if that's good or bad and mm -hmm. they can spin it, you know, however works for making it seem the most dramatic to make it seem oh, like yeah. we really thought we were going to lose, or we really thought we were going to win when really just got a great poker face, <laughs> but it, they could have put anything, they could have stitched anything together out of all the emotions that we were experiencing at the time. Yeah. Sure. A lot of times like, in a situation like that, you're not even really having emotions. You're just reacting. <laughs> That's like what Mike Tyson said. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> and yeah. then that plan goes right out the window. What were you going to say, Robert? Actually, that, that's one thing that came up in the community recently was someone posted someone about, oh, you have a plan. And then it just turns into full send. And really, I think you only have a plan for the first 10 seconds of a match and then it becomes full send no matter what. Absolutely. Um, because yeah. if your plan doesn't work within the first 10 seconds, it's not worth continuing on it. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah. You know who I love to watch drive. I love the team from, uh, Oh, what is it? They're, they're, they're from Brazil. Uh, it's not Matador. It's, it's not Matador. Minotaur. 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 There you go. God, I love watching him drive. 
that dude, that's yeah. a guy that loves his robots. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, that guy is intense. Have you, have you met them? Because they weren't there this year, right? No, they weren't. Yeah. No. Wow. In the chat, somebody's asking, how traumatic is it to lose and have a bot rip to shreds? I think it's pretty much expected, but what do you guys say? Yeah, that's one thing I do love about the community. Because you have to go into this sport knowing your bot's probably not coming home. So, like, a lot of egos and stuff like that get left at the door because... And then there's a lot of people at end of the events that are like, my robot's still together and I don't want to go home with a working robot. Let's <laughs> hammer on it until it doesn't work anymore. So that's one of my favorite things about the the, group, the community is because there's a like a good chance you're not coming home. Like you can't have, you can't get super frustrated over your bot breaking. Like you can't have those super high emotions and start throwing tantrums and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm curious, Jeff, yeah. actually, I was, I, Jeff, you, I figure you might have an interesting perspective on the difference in how Wumbo and off track did it this last Norwalk. I'm just kind of wondering how that whole event played out for you in terms of like your expectations and how it went and what you left the event kind of thinking about. I think with a lot of it with, especially with the Wumbo is last, I went back in, was it March? You get us every two months. So in March, April, May. Yeah. So back in March, uh, Wumbo only went like one and two. So it only won one fight and lost twice because I was doing a lot of gremlins. But uh, I come back. I might know something about gremlins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you, you figure out what's wrong. Back on what you're saying, you don't want to leave with the working robot because you want to know what fails. If you find out oh. what your point is it, you can, when you come back and go to rework on it, I need to work on this part. Make sure this is going. So, I did a lot of that with the new version that I ended up taking back in June, and I believe it I went ended up going like seven and two this event. From first event going one and two, to mm -hmm. you know winning seven fights and going to losing two. Yeah. yeah, it's a big difference, and that's just all from I didn't want to leave with the working robot. See, that's an extremely healthy way. Number one. And in a very low stress way to look at it, I like that. Mm -hmm. I, I, but I guess, like to to what Robert was saying earlier, you really have to show damage as much as off track does, right? Yeah, Wumbo doesn't really show damage. I mean, Wumbo, I didn't replace a single part the entire event on Wumbo though. Like, Wumbo wow. didn't take any damage until I fought Shredder Bro. And then what happened? How I don't know if I don't remember. For you? with off track like though because that's one that more visibly you can see like wombo you can generally looks pretty indestructible and performs the same way all the time not the same way but is more predictable in some ways like uh, i don't know uh, i was surprised off track and more complex so that's why it usually has a lot more going on and it shows it because i made some decisions about the side rails and it turns out those are really soft so they showed a lot more damage than they were really taking. Ablative. It's ablative. Yeah, it's ablative. It's ablative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, off track is a maintenance nightmare. So I'm glad I'm going to something else, but I'm pretty sure shufflers are going to be even more of a nightmare than tracks. Yeah, but then yeah. you have the excuse of it being a shuffler. Like, who else yeah. is doing it? You're going to be doing it better than most other people because most other people aren't doing it at all. Yeah. I want to show what the smaller bots look like. Let's see them bots. So this was an attempt. This is a one pound robot, which you can get away some, with geometry. You can't get away with the bigger bots. So this has a gigantic 
egg beater. And And this version didn't work out so well. I have a new version that I'm going to be testing out in the next competition, which it's actually even bigger. Let's see. Where did I put it? No, I can't find it right now. But yeah, so this one, the idea behind this one is this weapon actually comes really close to the floor. Mm -hmm. So I just don't play the ground game. I just hit anything that tries to get under me. Okay. And really, I just face the opponent and I don't try to get to the sides or anything. And then we got the undercutter I showed you guys earlier. Yeah. This is 150 grams, so this is one of the smallest weight class you'll see. Man, for its size, that must pack a hell of a punch. It really does. I could peel curls out of our steel walls. And then, unfortunately, a lot of times when you come back to a competition, you take your robots apart. So Mm -hmm. I don't have a lot together, but... (laughs) <laughs> this right here is yeah. something you won't see at heavyweights either it's a hub motor so the motor is integrated into the weapon okay and it saves a ton of weight and space in your robots sure yeah yeah so i was going to ask you about that you mentioned about how something wouldn't scale up is there a lot of stuff like that where the smaller robots don't you know, something that works fine in a even a 30 pound robot is just not going to fly in a 250. Yeah, anything that the shocks like your shocks are going to get worse and worse. So that's why hub motors don't work is the magnets are taking shocks directly every time you hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then like really large geometry like this doesn't work very well because it's just so thin bots like jackpot will cut right through it. And if you watched our first fight in jackpot, we had these super long forge, which works great in beetle weights, but the metal like is so weak that when we were turning, they started bending. And a lot of that stuff you just find out by trying it and being like, oh, that didn't work. Well, let's try something else. Yeah. All right, so, Jeff, uh, I know you, you have a stack. Let's have, see your stack. Can, actually, this whole, I don't know if I can share my screen right now, but at the start of this, I started drawing up a robot and it's already, it's done. So if you want to check that out, which is totally sure, normal. Let's... Everybody works that fast. Just Everybody does totally that. Totally normal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Let's see. I will embiggen you now. Embiggen. In, in the chat, somebody asks uh, if you have parts that you can 3D print for for ease. I'm guessing so that you have them with you. Something like that. Uh, so actually, a lot of the three pound bots and under are all mm-hmm. 3D printed. With TPU and nylon, you're talking like people use TPU as armor. So you could very easily do a full 3D printed robot, except for the weapon. The weapon is the only thing that has to be metal. Yeah. So Hmm. when I was doing our prep, I found this line around. So I figured, uh, let's build something around it. So this, this is a fairy weight weapon. Okay. And, uh, uh, fairy weight is how much? Uh, fairy weight is 150 grams. So 150 if grams. Okay. Share my screen. I don't know if I can or not. If you do, we'll see it here. What condition it'll be in? I make no promises. This is something I threw together off of this little blade right here. That's what you saw me measuring. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You just take your little parts, caliper, and you just transfer everything. So literally that whole robot is these components right here that I'm holding yeah. in my hand. And this is a, it's a very simple fairy weight. 
So it'll just be 150 grams. And what's mm -hmm. nice about these is you can use a lot of hot glue construction with these. Wow. So the hole underneath is this hollow, and you just mm -hmm. hot glue it together. So it, even like you design it for like 3D printing. So you would yeah. have it print. So let me open up the body. We'd have it print like this. Mm -hmm. Wow. So then your only infill so, would be right here. That is super cool. All right, well, but don't you worry about things like, because if you take a, a decent impact, won't your, isn't there a, a fairly decent likelihood that it'll knock the hot glue loose? Shouldn't you at least have some kind of like a shelf printed into it to hold up the... It's, it's pretty, or is that not a concern? You'd be pretty surprised how resilient hot glue is in rope combat. Yeah, so Damn. hot glue is very rubbery, so it absorbs mm -hmm. shocks really well. And then mm -hmm. when we use hot glue, we don't just put it down and then stick something. You cut, you we encase things in it. Ah, okay. But this, I'm probably actually going to throw this in the printer tonight, and I'll probably make this for uh, June. Yeah. Nice, but um, like most of my stuff is all done in this virtual space. So a lot of my stuff. Oh, that's here. yeah. Wait, so is that the, the a shuffler or is that a? I this see tracks, track. but there was. Okay, I just, but I saw uh, a show. I, I just had these in here because I was a, I'm looking at scale of like how big these gotcha. would be. And I know how big an off track is because I can mm -hmm. hold off track. So I wanted to make sure like, these were good to go. I I find that funny. You're like, I know how big is a, uh, an off track is. And then when you estimated, it was way off. Like four <laughs> inches. I couldn't believe <laughs> uh, Yeah, it's like four inches. That's all. Yeah. Uh, they're asking uh filament see that is just that is just super cool like when so when did you start doing did you uh, do 3d cad like as a job or something and then uh, graduated from that all, this is all self-taught yeah i that's how i learned was self-taught it's amazing that's awesome that is super cool like in the chat we're asking uh, if this is filament or resin print, I'm pretty sure filament, but uh, FDM. Yeah. So filament FDM, or yeah. yeah, deposit, whatever FDM, whatever it stands for. Filament yeah. disco machine. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, is what filament it disco for. machine. I like that yeah, one. Excellent. Yeah. But no, um, we All use right. um, the materials we use. Like for this, I'll probably end up using a uh, TPU because it's super flexy and it's really good at impact absorption. Oh, a Here's TPU. That. Yeah, or a, um, a like a nylon bridge or a nylon 910. I have no idea what any of those things are. What's a, what's a TPU? <laughs> TPU is a, it's like a rubbery filament. It's really flexible and- Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's a, it's, sometimes it's hard to print it, but once you get your machine to accept it, it's easy as printing PLA. Gotcha. Okay. It's one of those things that's like, it's fidgety, but it's worth taking time to, to push through the fidgets. And, uh, and. Okay. Oh, oh man. This, this is just amazing. Oh, you, oh, oh, wait a minute. What have we here? That is a thing that we have not seen before, isn't it? No. It's it's, been, that... it's, it's mostly public, but oh, yeah, that's the new version of Jackpot. That is going to be so awesome. <laughs> yeah, right. oh. yeah self-writers. Somebody said that was important, so we figured well, we give the people you know, what they want. Yeah, that that is that is what the people want. You know, you got to. So do instead it. of more weapon, they got more self rider. I, I think you guys have. You already have more weapon. We could go twenty pounds heavier. 
Oh my! I mean, we, wait. So we, we you're only more at two thirty. So the the weapon no, right no, now. No. Is... The weapon is not at its maximum weight. Yeah, there's a maximum oh. weight of eighty pounds for vertical spinners. Yeah. So yeah. right now we're at fifty eight pounds. Okay. But we actually we did double the power. We're spinning faster this year, or we're spinning uh-huh. fi- fifty miles an hour faster. Nice. Wow. Wait, 50 miles an hour. So what's your tip speed like? 250. Nice. What, wait, so last year it was only 200? Yeah, yeah. That's if well, we, 250 that's is the maximum good. speed you can go. You guys got to, like, you guys watching this, you got to go back and watch last season of BattleBots. Like, the things they did that to, to Ghost Raptor especially, that was, it was just awesome. Just awesome, and and you built that you built that robot in what, what was it? Something like four weeks. Yeah, it was yeah, a really quick weeks. build. Good grief! Where can we watch BattleBots free? I don't uh, rob a bank and then buy Discovery Plus. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know. That's all I got. Wow! No, this so, is this Discovery is going to be so cool. Discovery Plus is doing ahead. a free trial. That's the thing. But oh, there you go. Have a Discovery free trial Plus. That you can just binge it. Just mainline all the battle bots. Just knock it all down. That's the way to go. So this I'm, is not. Go, go ahead. In nylon. I know. Yeah. Uh, someone was interested in this earlier, but this is a really tough material. Oh you wow! Know, I'm not like I can flex it because of just the geometry, but mm-hmm. even with really wide Dang. flexing, it's really not. It's not damaging. It will just flex back. And so these prints are really strong. Yeah. And what material is that again? That's, is that the F? So this is nylon. Machine? Yeah, this is filament. This particular uh, is nylon. So it's really strong. And it's a little bit fl- like this is what you want if you ha- want a little bit of flex, but not like where you can pe- uh, fold it on itself. Okay. Since it looks like I'm going to be getting a 3D printer before too long, I'll, yes. I'll, have, to, I'll have to refer back to this. Wow. Well, not, not, it's not anytime soon. Just, just, I've had some ideas for a while though. And now that I know that there's a place to go to, you see, I think that's part of, that's a big part of what it is. Having a place that you can go and do the things at, you know what I mean? If you sit here and I make a 250 pound robot. I'm, what am I going to do with it? Yeah. <laughs> Great. I have it now. I can tow a car, but with you guys having a, a local place where you can fight, like not 250 pounds, but you can bring what, what's the max size on your three you guys pounds. go up to what? Th- three pounds. Yeah. Three pounds is still, you have to go to one of these competitions to really understand what three pounds means. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and, even when you're not actually fighting, I think in the year leading up to deciding to do battle bots before everything shut down anyway, like we were seeing each other almost every weekend yeah. for mm-hmm. just putting the arena together, fixing up whatever we figured, oh, we want to add lights this weekend or just, yeah. hey, I'm working on my robot and I need to be in a room with other people who know what they're doing <laughs> kind of stuff. Wow. Like we were, it was really funny once everything shut down that it's like oh my gosh i haven't gone this long without seeing you people since i've met you <laughs> oh, <Aww>. <laughs> yeah that, that has been rough no no doubt what were you gonna say but then we hit our quota on that oh. from being at BattleBots and not not seeing each other for like a month and a half so it all yeah <laughs> man that that was a rough time come home battle bots go to work thinking about battle bots, you know? Yeah. Weekend yeah. was just more battle bot work. Ugh. How long were you guys out there? There are worse problems, you know? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. It was like, two weeks of filming, but four weeks of absolutely losing our minds up until then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. There you go. So this is the world famous blue waffle. Ask for it yeah. not on the internet. It's pretty awesome. So what's the story with this one? 
is it a, it's a, a shell spinner, right? Yeah. So that's why it has all these bits underneath of it. Oh, wow. It's a little tiny. To give you a different shell spinner, because I think sometimes what's been happening too is I'll be struggling really hard with something and then Jeff's going to look at mm -hmm. it and be like, oh, you know how that should be done? And then he's going to do it. Like now he's doing the shuffler, like my <laughs> shell, like this was the size of the original fairy weight. It's, it's okay. Four inches. Not the four inches that off track is, but. <laughs> That's a totally different four inches, right? Yeah. And then uh, this is the inside for one pound cookie. And it's just one motor, one ESC. The battery yeah. goes over here or over here. Very cool. And that's all there is to it. It just vibrates around. That's the thing. <laughs> oh, for it. That's so cool. Is that one going to be making uh, an appearance at the, uh, the next competition? Oh, it'll always be for the one for, for one pounds. This one's pretty reliable because also. I have two of them good to go right now. I have a third one oh, okay. almost set up just because I thought at one point that I was going to run three of them instead of the three pound cookie. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, that did not come to pass. That would have been an experience I don't think anyone was ready for. But well, yeah, it doesn't sound like fun. Yeah, I'm yeah, disappointed no, but, that but... didn't happen. I think watching. <sighs> Three cookies in an arena would have been way too fun. It could have, but one pound cookie is too... It wasn't going to hold up against anything. It would have been really fun for the four seconds it took for somebody to hit all of them. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but that kind of happened with three, with the four and a half pound version too. Like it's... Yeah, so that's that shell spinner. And then Jeff was looking at that and I think looking at it being like, okay, but how could it actually like work? So he did a yeah. of wheels that has reach and retain retention that works way better than anything going on. Well, it's nice that that too I is use... anything that we prototype at the same time, they get transferred to each other. Mm -hmm. Well, and you're such an like amazing synthesizer, just sort of everything that you wind up observing, the way you apply it to stuff really is pretty remarkable and i think a lot of that shows in jackpot like some things like the forks didn't necessarily work but all the things that you could take from different beetle weight builds and put into that yeah. i think is like your experience in that is really and obviously robert too and all the insight that we got from the battlebots teams for how it might scale up for heavies i think the way all that came together is pretty unique Absolutely. Yeah, I knew that there was an amount of iteration to it, but what I didn't realize was exactly how much and how much that is a, a foundational part of robot combat because, you know, I'm still tripping out a little bit about that being the rationale for, yeah, go ahead and destroy my robot. I want to see how it breaks. And that's yeah. really cool. And, and well, if you're going to have to repair it anyway, you might as well repair it a little better all the way yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah like you can just change if you have to change it because it's got trashed anyway put the hole in where you knew the hole needed to be or you realized the hole needed to be or at the support yeah. where you didn't realize you needed it most yeah. of the time like within your first match you already want to make changes yeah and it's i, I imagine a lot could of times be, it's that one thing list. that you I mentioned a lot of times it's that one thing that like right before you left, oh man, maybe I should do that. Nah, I'm not going to do it that way. I'll just do it this way. Oh, I had that. I had one where I like the last Norak I went to like three days before I go, oh, maybe these wedgelets weren't such a good idea. I go, I just don't have time to change them. And then I go in the match and I get wrecked hard twice in a row because of the bad design that I should have mm -hmm. just 3D printed something and, and hope that worked. And that was that, are you saying that was at, at Norwalk or that was for Jack, for Jackpot? Norwalk. Oh, for Norwalk. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say 3D printing. Wait, what? 
the jackpot. What? So yeah, man, I am. I I I know you guys probably don't know whether or not you're going to be on next year, but I cannot wait to see the next season of it. We have gone a full we, two it's hours. Been this a has journey. Been, it's been a it journey. It has. For those I'm of you just joining it. the stream, what we we did good. We did good today. Yeah. We, gold star on all of our charts. Three more, and we all get a pizza <laughs> party. You get an extra no, one it, because you had to deal with us being totally okay with it while it wasn't necessarily so fun. I had to you. deal with it. You guys were my <laughs> lifesaver, man. Like, like I'm, <laughs> So for those of you just checking out the stream now, we had, we had some audio gremlins sneak in. I don't know how the hell they got in here because we had them beat for a long time. Like We've had so, a lot of shows without airs, and uh, this was not one of them. The entire first hour was just taken up by troubleshooting, and it was just ridiculous. But these but guys, absolute troopers. What's that? You hit your quota for things being messed up, so now you're going to be good for a while. My God, I hope so. I hope that's true. Oh, <laughs> from, from your lips to the robot god, you guys ears. To Rusty's yeah, ears. Tell you something. To Rusty's, Rusty's ears. I forgot about Rusty. How did I forget about Rusty? Oh, my God. If there's a, if there's a new season, there's got to be a Rusty. They got to bring. We got to start. We, we need to write Discovery right now. Everybody, email Discovery. Got to be. There's got to be Dave. Dave's got to come back. He's got to do something. God, he's so. He, he is just that dude. He is a chill dude. I like him. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I, yeah. We we got to hang out with him quite a bit. He was on our side of the uh, the pits. So. Yep. It, he seems like he would just be a hoot and a holler to hang out with after the show. Yeah, he was pretty fun. I, yeah. We got re along really well with Captain Shredderator, Scorpios, uh -huh. Malice. Yeah. Really, anybody that we wound up spending any kind of time with, mm -hmm. Mammoth is now one of my favorite teams. Like, mm -hmm. we cut vinyl for Endgame. like anybody that we interacted with was just like you can find a reason to call him your favorite all right all right we have done our part for podcasting country here thank you guys for sure and and when i do finally get a, a robot kit we'll have to have at least one of you guys on to our project stream on monday nights and yeah. you want you guys come on and we'll build something together yeah. Sounds or, good. or at least you, you can watch and be like, "Hey, you you don't do that. You're being dumb." <laughs> put that down. Put that down. <laughs> put that down. No, no, walk away from the soldering iron. All right. Again, just just for everybody at home here, this has been the uh, the Sin Shop live stream. It is all on behalf of the Sin Shop, a uh, maker hacker space located in Las Vegas, Nevada, that has the tools and equipment that you can use to make pretty much whatever you can think of. We are currently closed. But if you'd like to either find out when the shop is going to be uh, open or get, get updates on the shop, or you'd like to stop by and check out the shop uh, or help us to uh, to make it ready, whatever you'd like to do, go to the Discord for it, sinshop.org forward slash Discord, join the shop build out channel and find out all the things. If you uh, would like to find out more about upcoming events, including virtual ones just like this one right here, you can go to uh, meetup.com forward slash sin shop. On next week's show, we are going to have the people from the Nerds of the Round, just Nerds of the Round. There's no table involved. Nerds of the Round podcast. Uh, if you like Marvel movies and you like to watch people talk about things, this is the show for you. It is absolutely wonderful podcast, and and I can't wait to have have Law return and have Sebastian on for the first time. So it's going to be really cool. Uh, and also, I, there was another person. I can't remember who what his name was right now. Tony, there it is. Tony, I found him. All right. So anyway, <laughs> we'll all be on. Oh, uh, tonight's followers, I want to thank you very much. Thick Nick Daddy, thank you so much for the follow. Nick, N-I-C-K, for those of you playing the home game. Also, I'd like to uh, uh, send a big thanks to uh, Johnny Week. Thank you so much for the follow. We definitely do appreciate that. All right, with no, with no further ado, wackadoo, guys, thank you again so much for, for joining us. I cannot wait for, for your live events to pick up, and we're going we're gonna to work out a way to, uh, to stream those things, too, and, and bring 
those fine programs to you. And so watch this space for more information on that stuff. No, no announcements yet. I'm not saying anything at all. I'm just saying. I haven't said a word. Except all the words I just said. Okay. All right. With that, have a good night. Join us here on Monday for our project stream. I am, of course, the Mighty Pong, and this is the team from VCR. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it.